All right, I'm Tim. Uh, I'm with Sci-5. I'm going to talk about RISC-V external debug, which is what most people just think of as JTAG debugging. Uh, so the goals for this project is basically to build a debug system that works for everybody, not just for Sci-5, which means that if you notice that we missed something, let us know. Uh, my email address is in the slides. Uh, we want to like, make it so that you know, everybody feel, would feel comfortable with this debug uh, uh, interface if it were to be standardized. Uh, for right now, we're hoping to have a working system done on July 1st, which basically means running a RISC-V processor on an FPGA with a real hardware JTAG debugger hooked up to that system and talking to that through probably GDB and you know, debugging real code. Uh, the specification will be submitted to the RISC-V Foundation, and I'm sure there'll be some process that happens, but hopefully it'll be mostly good already at that point, because you guys are all going to let us know when something is not good, like tomorrow rather than you know, in six months. Uh, we're going to release the, any debugger code we write that's open source, and we're going to release open source implementations for the rocket ship and Z-scale architectures of this interface. Uh, right now, where we're at is basically all the spec is mostly written, uh, so there's still a bunch left to do, but we feel we can, you know, get it done. Uh, the features supported are, first of all, basically performing arbitrary reads and writes over system bus. That's kind of what the whole debug architecture is focused around. Uh, there's a framework to debug any component in a platform, so not just RISC-V cores. If you have some other stuff in there, you should be able to use the same debug interface to debug that as well. Uh, we've got software breakpoints for RISC-V. You can access the registers. Uh, you can execute arbitrary instructions. So that means if you have a RISC-V core with your own custom instructions, you do not have to change the debug interface to, to be able to like, access that from a debugger. Uh, we have uh, different debug transports. Uh, the current spec only uh, lists like regular JTAG. Uh, we're working on 1149.7, which is two-wire JTAG. And in the future, we could, like, should be pretty easily able to add more uh, debug transports. Uh, you can use the debug transport for something else that's not debugging. Kind of the obvious feature for that is if, if your firmware has a, some kind of command line interface, you could run a serial, kind of a serial port type thing over the debug interface in case you don't actually have a real serial port working yet on your hardware. Uh, you can debug code from the very first instruction executed. Uh, that basically means we can reset straight into debug code. Nothing has been executed yet and start single stepping or look, looking at state then, which is one of the cases that you really want external hardware debug for. Uh, there's some hardware breakpoints specified and the same things are used for trace triggers. And there's a simple uh, trace spec which allows you to like trace what's going on in the chip. Uh, we may or may not implement this before July 1st, kind of depending on how important and hard it seems. Uh, so this is an overview of the system, <coughs> kind of going clockwise. There's the debugger, probably GDB, running on some PC. Uh, it talks over a debug transport to the debug transport module, uh, which, as I said, is currently JTAG. And the debug transport module basically gives the debugger access to the system bus. On the system bus, then we have a debug program memory section, which is used for halting and debugging RISC-V cores. Then in each RISC-V core, there's a little debug module, which is really just a couple of CSRs accessible over the system bus. There's a trace module, which may send trace data to the system bus. Uh, there's a hardware breakpoint module, which is really just kind of inside the RISC-V core. And then there are other components in the system, which are also on the system bus, and therefore the debugger can also access them. So the debug transport module is it, really pretty minimal. All it does is it gives the debugger access to the system bus so that the debugger can perform 8-bit, you know, 16-bit, 32-bit reads and writes on the system bus. And through that, like talk to any component that's, that's a slave on the system bus, which the RISC-V core will be. Uh, in addition to that, it implements a simple message queue. Uh, the reason for the queue is that typically a debugger when all cores are running, we'll be constantly checking on the cores, like, is it halted yet? Is it halted yet? Did something happen that I need to tell to my user? Which, in this uh, design, would involve talking over the system bus every time. And ideally, we don't have the debugger talking on the system bus all the time when, it's not, when there's nothing for it to do, because that affects the performance of the system. 
so instead, there's a simple message queue that's in the debug transport module so that when a component is halted, it can send a message to the debug transport module. That goes in the queue, and the debugger just constantly checks, is there anything in the queue for it, which it can do because it, without interfering with anything else. Uh, there's an optional little authentication mechanism specified in case you want to make chips that you want to be able to debug, but anybody who you give to should not be able to debug. Um, it's pretty minimal, but it's, it's there as a starting point. So with this bus access, we can like com debug components generically. There's kind of like the, f the four abstract features that are specified there. Our first is freezing a component, which you can basically think of as like, well, we just stop the clock to that component. And how the component implements that is up to it, but that's basically the idea. We stop it, and then we can set the clock going again, or we run a single, single cycle to run or halt from those states. Uh, the second mode is halting a component, which abstractly is more like, well, we stop this component, and it's going to do something that's going to be helpful to the debugger. Uh, the way to think of this in the context of RISC-V, for instance, is if there were CSRs or some other way to inspect the state of the pipeline, when you freeze a, freeze a RISC-V core, you should be able to look in the, in the, at, the, at the pipeline and see, oh, like, well, you know, this instruction is this far, and this thing is partially executed, then you can advance it a single clock and see what happened then, or just let it run again. Whereas when you halt it, actually, it completely finishes executing the current instruction, it flushes the rest of the pipeline, it jumps somewhere else. So in halt mode, you can be a lot more efficient in your, de in your debugging, but you lose that visibility into what's going on, like, at a really low level. Um, and like generic components, as I said before, they can send messages through the message queue so that the debugger doesn't have to pull them the whole time. And they also support uh, like a, an individual authentication. So if you're making a, a chip and you're using somebody else's Ethernet controller, they may not want you to debug the Ethernet controller, but they may want the capability to be in there in case something goes wrong and they need to like, debug something on your chip. Uh, so for RISC-V, Basically, the debug spec ex consists of we added some control and status registers uh, because those are now all, or will all be exposed on the system bus. Uh, so the, the new ones are there's a debug control and status register for kind of like catch all, anything that didn't fit anywhere else. The main thing it consists of is, a, is some bits that tell you, well, what happens when we execute an e-break instruction? Is it the regular old, like debug exception like it is currently, or should you go into debug mode? Uh, there's a debug PC register, which is used to save the value of the PC when we enter debug mode. Then there are three registers, two mailbox registers and a debug state register to allow communication between the debugger and the core running or being in debug mode. Usually that'll be of the kind, well, the core will like write some value, for instance, the, the mbox zero register, and then it'll update the state register indicating to the debugger, oh, something needs to happen. And in addition to updating the state, it will also send a message to the message queue so that the debugger could, in theory, work by polling, but in practice, it's probably just going to look at the message queue. So it sees, like, oh, there's something to be done for me now. The debugger will, will like, read the value of mbox0, for instance, uh, accesses to these mailbox, re mailbox registers, sets some additional bits in the state register, so now the code that's running on the core can see, like, oh, the debugger has done whatever I expected it to do and continue on to the next step. Um, in addition, there's a PC sample register. Uh, the idea of that, that is basically it contains a somewhat recent value of the PC all the time, which you can use for getting simple profiling data out of your run without having much fancy hardware. Um, then <clears throat> there's a debug memory. So there's one of these on the system. You don't need one per core. It's accessible for the, through the system bus. Um, and it should, isn't cached, certainly not in debug mode. Um, basically, it consists of one kilobyte of ROM, although most of that is going to be no ops. Uh, and the main reason to have this debug ROM is because we put some of the debug behavior into ROM as RISC-V instructions instead of like, putting additional like, logic requirements on the core. Like, the core doesn't have much new behavior to, to enable debug mode. It really just like, jumps to this ROM where all the new behavior is specified. So there's five functions in there. There's an entry function, which is where you jump to when you enter debug mode. There's an exit, which is where you jump to when you want to leave debug mode. Then there's a send x8, 
which will transmit to the debugger the value that's currently in X8 uh, using the mailbox and state registers that I described before. Uh, there's receive X8, which does the opposite. And then there's instruction loop, which seems a little counterintuitive, but turned out to be useful. Uh, what instruction loop does is it reads an instruction from mbox zero, writes it to the debug program RAM, which starts right after the ROM, and then jumps to the debug program RAM. So using that mechanism, you can ar execute an arbitrary instruction pretty easily. Uh, the debug ra RAM must be at least eight bytes. Uh, I haven't found anything yet that you can't really do with 16 bytes. I could imagine maybe you'd want 32 bytes. Any more than that, I, I'm sure somebody will find a use for having more than 32 bytes of debug RAM, and if they do, then they can like, put up to seven kilobytes of, of uh, RAM in there. Uh, but for a typical implementation, you wouldn't need nearly that much. So just as an example of what happens when you halt, for instance, when a software breakpoint is hit or the debugger writes the halt bit in a con debug control status register, first thing that happens is the core saves the PC to the debug PC. Uh, then it jumps to debug ROM, where the code there writes X1 to mbox 0, writes X9 to mbox 1, and then it signals the debugger. That means it changes the value in D state and sends a message to the message queue. And now the code running on the core basically busy waits until the bit gets set that indicates that mbox zero was read. So the debugger, like, it notices there's a message there or it notices that the state was changed. Uh, it reads the PC because pretty much debuggers always want to know the PC. Uh, it reads X9 from mbox one. It writes two jump instructions to the debug RAM. Um, next slide will make it obvious why you want two and then it reads the value of x1 from mbox0. Uh, doing that read sets the bit in the state register, so now the core can see it's like, oh, you know, the, the debugger did what, what I expected it to do. Uh, now it jumps to debug RAM, because that's what the code in the entry function says to do. Then it jumps to the instruction loop, because that's what the code we wrote to the debug RAM says to do. And then it writes x8 to mbox0, which is the first thing that happens in the instruction loop and it signals the debugger again. And now it goes and waits for the debugger to write to mbox zero. Uh, so the debugger, it sees like, oh, there's another state change. Uh, it reads x8 from mbox zero, and at that point it saved x1, x8, and x9, which basically means there's enough scratch registers for it, for it to do stuff, and the core is halted, and it's basically waiting for you to write instructions to be executed. So for instance, you could write x13 at this point, uh, fairly straightforward. The debugger can write the new value to mbox1, and it writes a move instruction to mbox0. And the core, which was waiting for mbox0 to be written, like sees, oh, it was written now, so it takes this instruction and writes it into the RAM. Um, it writes mbox1 to x8, because that's the hard-coded behavior, it always does that. Uh, then it jumps to debug RAM, which executes the move instruction, so now the value of x13 is changed and then it jumps back to instruction loop because previously we'd written two jump instructions and we only overwrote the first one. And then it signals the debugger again saying, oh, you know, we're ready to do this again. So using this mechanism, you can pretty much right, access arbitrary registers, arbitrary resources that you might add to your RISC-V core that are not part of the standard. Um, it's not the most efficient. Uh, if you need more efficiency, if you want to do stuff in bulk, you can take advantage of having more than eight bytes of RAM in your debug program RAM and write a small, like, a small program there. So for instance, assuming we had an extension that allowed access to data in the caches, uh, where there's a, two CSR registers, an index register and a data register, you, know, you like, write five to the index register and then you read from the data register to see you know, what, what is there in cache word five. Uh, you could write a, a small program like here, where basically we, we set our pointer register to zero, we write it to the index, then we read the data into x8, then we call the send x8 function, then we increment our pointer, and then we go and do it again. Uh, you can get into this easily from instruction loop, because like while the core is waiting for you to write an instruction, you just go and change the debug program RAM, then you feed it the move x9 comma zero instruction into mbox zero, It'll jump there and it'll start executing your loop. Uh, you may see there's no way to get out of this loop. 
Um, again, the debugger can control getting out of the loop because in sendx8, there's a state where the core is waiting for something to happen. And while it's doing that, the debugger can just replace the add instruction with a jump back to instruction loop, getting you back there. So the debugger could very easily execute this loop, uh, like read 256 entries with like no overhead, with really the only thing going on being like the transfer, transferring of the data, and then change the debug program to get out of it. Uh, you can actually do this loop in 16 bytes if you're clever, but that didn't seem worth explaining here, like trying to be too clever. Uh, so that's how the basic debugging works. There's hardware breakpoints spec'd out. Uh, you can have a ridiculously large amount of them. Uh, I would imagine that most implementations are going to have four or maybe eight. Um, each hardware breakpoint can support either an exact address match, an address range match, a masked address match. For data, the same options exist, and it can trigger either on loads, stores, or instructions being executed. Uh, every hardware breakpoint can individually implement whatever subset of those features that it wants. So if you just want some sim like two simple ones in your system and one complicated one, you can do that. Uh, triggered hardware breakpoints can they cause a debug exception, uh, just like software breakpoints do now. That means you can use the hardware breakpoint module even like even when there's no debugger attached, and it can still, it can still be useful. Um, triggering a hardware breakpoint may enter debug mode, which is what we're talking about here. Uh, it could also cause some tracing to start or tracing to stop, or to emit a single trace sequence just for that one match, which is the kind of thing that you would use if you want to trace memory accesses just to a specific region of memory, and just like trace those things. Uh, there's a simple trace spec uh, where basically trace data consists of sequences of four-bit packets. Uh, the simple one is the NOAA packet, which is four bits and doesn't do anything. Uh, more interesting is a PC sequence, which starts with a PC packet, then a count packet, and then a number of data packets. Uh, the count is there in case you don't want to send the whole PC. Uh, most jumps are not that far, so you can like transmit the value with uh, less than full data. So you could say, like, if your count is three, then it's followed by 12 bits of data. Uh, and the, the thing that's interpreting the trace data can then know, like, oh, I got these 12 bits of PC updated, and I'll take the, last, the top 20 bits of the last PC that I had to make a full 32-bit PC. There's branch not taken and branch taken packets. There's a trace disabled packet, a trace enabled packet, which gets a version so you can identify what kind of trace data you're looking at. There's a privilege level change package, pa uh, packet, sorry, which is followed by the details, like, well, what's the new privilege level, and are interrupts enabled? There's a load address, which is also followed by, you know, count and data. There's a store address, load data, store data, which are all the same, and then there's a timestamp. Uh, you're typically not gonna, like, see all of those in trace outputs. You can be fairly flexible in deciding, well, which set of these packets do you actually want, depending on what you care about. Uh, uh, so this trace data can be sent either to the system bus, it could go to an internal memory, um, or it could go even over like an external port. Uh, we don't spec any of that, and probably won't, at least not in the near future, until kind of figure out what we really want to do. Uh, even the trace data format is a pretty rough spec. There's probably a lot more optimal formats that exist, but that we didn't have time to look at. Uh, so it basically, I think I covered most of these in the previous slide. I mean, output to the three different places. You have pretty good control over what's output, and the hardware breakpoint module can be used to, to start and stop trace, so you can do things like start tracing when I hit this exception handler, and then stop tracing when some other function gets executed or something like that. Uh, the specific uses that I've kept in mind are like basically reconstructing all PC values without having much knowledge about the system. Uh, so if you just output PC packets, you can output a PC packet anytime there's a jump or an interrupt and you just output the old PC and a new PC, and with that information, the, the trace de decoder can just figure out, like, oh, all these blocks of instructions were all just completely executed. Uh, you might want to watch, you know, accesses of 
where memory accesses in some address range or trigger on certain values. And I guess the clear thing that everybody ideally wants is to reconstruct all processor state uh, that requires more trace bandwidth and a much smarter decoder that could decoder, like to be at all efficient, the decoder would have to know like what instructions are being executed, um, what does every instruction actually do to, the, to all the registers, it basically has to include a simulator. Uh, but you can like achieve all of these by picking the right selection of, of uh, trace sequences. Um, that's all I had to say. Uh, the main thing I want to say again is if there's stuff that should be in the debug spec that you haven't seen mentioned, talk to me, give me feedback. Um, I, like we want to make a spec for everybody, so uh, we can only do that if you help. Um, other than that, I'm going to be posting the latest version of the spec to the hardware dev list later today. And otherwise, do you have any questions? Yeah. What is the relationship between So I did, this is not a one-to-one -one match of what GDB can do. Right. Um, for the common things that you will want to do in GDB, you're basically talking about software breakpoints, accessing memory, reading and writing registers. That's about like 99% of what anybody does in GDB. And those exist in both places. Yes. Um, I'm pretty sure GDB can do hardware breakpoints. I don't know the details about what it can support. It seems likely that there's not a perfect match here. Um, I don't. I think there's some experimental trace support in GDB, and that I, I'm not sure on either. Yeah. Multi-heart. Oops. So uh, I think there might be more support needed for supporting multiple cores. Uh, so the the idea behind multiple cores is simply that. We, can, we have multiple of these RISC-V blocks. And to the debugger, the, like the debugger accesses a different core because its CSRs are in a different, like at a different address. But they share memory, so how you, you're going to have multiple debug modules looking at the same shared memory? Uh, you, one debug, well. Debug modules shouldn't, or multiple debug modules should not talk to the same core unless they really know about each other. Or maybe, maybe I misunderstood your question. The debug module is, is inside the RISC-V core, or inside the RISC-V heart. Maybe we should talk about this later. Uh, what kind of overhead do you have for the tracing support uh, in terms of both you know, uh, well, two questions. How does it scale with the number of instructions, the, the amount of data that you collect for tracing? And uh, in terms of time, what is the overhead uh, in addition to the runtime? Um, I, I don't have a good answer for you there. The trace was mostly specified because people seem to really want trace in a spec. So now there is trace in a spec, which at least gives us a starting point to start improving it. I haven't even done anything simple like you know, construct like what would this trace data look like for a sample run. Okay. So I don't have enough information to answer your question right now. Right, if you're interested in this, like this seems like an, a really obvious place where the spec could be improved a lot by, you know, trying some formats, seeing how good are they, what, what are their impact. We got a question over here, Tim. Could you say a little more about the authentication mechanism? Sure. I mean, the, the authentication mechanism in both cases is basically says like, well, there's a, there's a register, there's two modes. Either you can write a password to this register, and if you write the right password, then the debug section is unlocked, or there's a challenge response, meaning you can read a challenge from this register, and if you then write the correct response, the, the module is unlocked. But that's all, this, all that I spec. I didn't say anything about specific like encryption or checksums or anything. To, like it's, it's completely left up to whoever wants to implement the authentication. Yeah, the main hope behind authentication is that a debugger doesn't have to know anything special, but no, like, oh, this is where the register is. I just need to prompt the user for this magic key, possibly displaying a challenge that that should accommodate most use cases. <laughs>
uh, any plan to make the debug transport module being visible on the system bus? In that case, maybe another CPU in the platform can access the debug module then to debug risk five because in some production case, we, we will not have the JTAG or USB IO support, especially at the cu customer side uh, when we are doing on-field support. So if we can make the debug transport module a interface, uh, make an interface spec, then we can design, for example, a, a separate, separate debug software on the, uh, on the platform running on another CPU, then debug this risk five. So uh, let me, I think you're asking, is it possible to debug one risk core from a, another risk core in the same platform? Uh, and I mean, the, at least the answer to that question would be yes, modulo, whatever permissions you set up on the system bus. Uh, okay, so uh, maybe not, not must have for another risk of but just to make the debug transport module decoupled with the, the specific interface on the chip, for example, JTAG or USB, et cetera. I mean, it's certainly possible. You, you could implement your own debug transport module if you have, you don't want whatever we have. Like, you could completely invent your own thing that writes to the system bus, and then ev everything else in the system is still completely usable, like as described. Um, do you have any thoughts towards integrating this debug support into the Boom code base? Uh, to integrating what, sorry? Into integrating this uh, work into the Boom code base. You mentioned Rocket and uh, Zscale. Um, I don't know what, what our story is, but. Sorry? Not yet. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so in terms of integrating it into Zscale, are you planning on doing it in the Chisel version, the Verilog version, both, neither? Um, I don't know. Andrew? So he said ch Chisel first, maybe Verilog later. And one, one other question about, sort of along the same lines of multi-core debug, but on the board, you know, it's not uncommon sometimes to have like, you know, two or three identical devices on the board, and it's really nice when you're debugging them if you can use like a single 1149.7 or, you know, that kind of transport protocol, so you don't have like four or five things plugged into your, uh, into your, into your debug machine. But to be able to do that, you have to be able to enumerate the different devices that are on the on the uh, transport. Have you given any thought to the ways we might be able to do that? Um, not beyond. If you're making a chip with multiple, where, where you really want multiple debug transport modules, it would make a lot of sense to put the 1149.7 like front end onto that and then just uh, use the two wire start topology. Well, I, I'm thinking more at the board level where let's just, for the simplest cases, you have two identical chips on the board and you'd like to be able to talk to them with one transport module, but somehow you have to enumerate, you know, that one of them is chip zero and one of them is chip one. So if there was some way to sort of to specify that in a standard way, it might save us trouble down the road. This spec is purely thinking, like in, in, in this picture, the platform is the, is the chip, not the board. Oh, okay, but at the end of the day, the platform is the board, right? So if we sure, talk but, two steps but, ahead, but we so might save some trouble. At, at that level, you do whatever, you have whatever options JTA gives you, which is if you use old school, you daisy chain them. If you want to use dot seven, then you can use a start topology of some kind. Okay. Given that you were envisioning a lot of flexibility in the implementation of, uh, for example, the amount of RAM and the capabilities of hardware breakpoints, something like that, that uh, it's kind of a loose capability spectrum. Is there any way to uh, dynamically identify what the capabilities are, some kind of discovery mechanism? of capabilities or is the thought that there's going to be a database hell of every variation that anybody's ever done, uh, listing all the capabilities of that variant? Um, and if so, is, that, is there gonna be some central registry so at least you know where the gateway to hell is? Um, the, the idea is that you can look, look at a chip and we have, uh, what is it called? There's like a machine tree description, something that I believe ARM came up with which the goal is will be part of some other RISC-V spec, or so I'm told. Uh, but the idea is very much that a debugger can look at a chip and without having a giant database, have no, like, what are the capabilities of this chip? Uh, the, the, the other side of that is, can the software look at your 
debug module and see what its capabilities are so the software does not have to be rebuilt for every of the wide range of possible things that it can, uh, yeah, yes. it can configure itself dynamically to what, what's there. Yes, software that should like, be implemented to the spec can look at, can be connected to something and talk to the chip and discover what its capabilities are. Um, I would like uh, to ask you about transport layer um, because in my opinion, uh, GDB uh, protocols both using server side and client side. Uh, in your picture. Hold, hold the mic up, we can't, I, I can't hear you anyway. I don't know if others can. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, on your picture, it's looking like uh, GDB uh, client site implemented fully in hardware and uh, represent as a debug transport model. And between these two instances of debugger external GDB and debug transport model, uh, using is is used uh, GDB protocol uh, as is uh, I mean it is a text messages uh, or something like that uh, and uh, such messages should be uh, directly transport uh, uh, through the JTAC or USB. It looks it, it looks a bit strange uh, for me because in that case um, debug transport model uh, will represent. Um, as a separate processor on the system bus. So uh, what, what I did not break out in this picture, and probably I should have, is so there's GDB, and then there's something that translates GDB messages to the debug transport. So the debug transport module is not the thing that interfaces with GDB directly. Um, for instance, there's a thing called OpenOCD, which is a plugin like which can, sits in between GDB and generic JTAG debuggers. So it it would know how to translate GDB to Risk Five, and that will be part of the any debug software that we might write. Okay. All right. Well, obviously, lots of uh, interesting questions for you, Tim. So thanks for that. Give give Tim a hand. Thanks.